Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you during the liturgical season of Lent, where we ponder questions about the meaning of life and face the reality of death and our ephemerality head on. We're also in the final week of Women's History Month where we celebrate the accomplishments of all who identify as women, confess and lament the ways white women plunder women of color in their quest for pseudo-feminism, and name the long road we must still walk together towards full gender parity. Today's lectionary brings us to Luke 15. The whole chapter of Luke 15 is a series of three parables that follow a similar pattern. Something is lost and then found. First, a shepherd has 100 sheep, one is lost, then found. Then a woman, ha a woman has 10 coins, one is lost and then found. And finally, the parable we read today of the lost son, a final narrative in a series on forgiveness, the likely literary climax of Jesus's extended discourse. An all too familiar parable if you grew up in the church or with a biblical foundation as I did. Anybody else? This is a familiar parable for anyone else. Let us know in the chat. Perhaps the familiarity of this story has made it really difficult for me to preach on it this morning. If I'm being honest, and you know I am pretty honest, I don't love this parable. It's a difficult one for me. I'm not sure if it's the unapologetic patriarchal nature of it. I mean, really, where are the women in the story? The seemingly simple lesson, God loves us and welcomes us home no matter what we do. The uncomfortable sibling tension, which believe me has become even more poignant as the mother of two sons myself. The discomfort that arises in my body when I imagine myself putting in the work like the older son, but not really being seen. Then wondering, what does that say about me? Do I not lead with grace and forgiveness? I don't love this parable. But I wonder what us asking a whole lot of questions and implying some new hermeneutics together might do for us. Jewish New Testament scholar Amy Jill Levine reminds us, not only do we often miss, in, miss the original provocation of the parables, but we also often imply ahistorical and archaic readings that distort the essence of the gospel into something Jesus really wouldn't be about. One common way parables are interpreted is by drawing a contrast between what Jesus taught and what Jewish people generally understood. If we do that here, we come to the age-old thesis of this parable that God welcomes us home and loves us no matter what we do, because that was in contrast to the rigidness of the Pharisees. But if we look at the totality of Jewish scripture to interpret God's love for God's sons as new or unique doesn't really fit with everything else we know about God. That's literally the essence of who God is. God is love. God is radical welcome. So that's not the takeaway here. What is it? I have so many questions when I read this parable. Anybody else? Put some of the questions that arise in you when you read this story in the chat. What is home? Who defines it? Is coming home always good? What does it mean to be lost? Lost from what and found to whom or what? Do we all want to be found? I wonder further, why did the younger brother really want to leave home when he did? Was there something about home that unsettled him? Was there already tension in his familial relationships or perhaps something worse? Why did the father let him go when he did without more discourse? Was there another parent? Where are they? And what really happened while the younger brother was away? We've been conditioned to believe there was sexual promiscuity but there's nothing in the original Greek that lends itself to that. So it actually makes me kind of angry that purity culture jumped in here and uses this as an opportunity to demonize sexuality and sexual activity. I have more questions when we get to the younger brother's return. How long was it between when the father saw him down the road and began the party and when the older son was like, hey dad, remember me? Based on what we know about Jewish cultural traditions and meals, we can imagine it was probably a good bit of time. So really, Dad, you forgot about the older son for that long? <laughs> and finally, how does this parable end? What are the conversations between the two brothers like now? How long does it take for them to begin feeling like a family again, to be in right relationship? Or do they ever get there? 
The more I've wrestled with this parable this week, the more I've come to the conclusion that like with most things, we would do well to divest ourselves from a Eurocentric patriarchal white hermeneutic and instead ask questions and read this story through feminist, African-American, Jewish, anti-racist lenses. A feminist hermeneutic, as pointed out by Louise Skrodoff, allows us to see the father as one who rules over numerous enslaved people, both male and female, as well as family members who are female, but never mentioned in the story. And further, Skrodoff firmly rejects the typical allegorizing that identifies God as the father in this story, as this divinizes the patriarchal father and fosters a romantic, I would add dangerous, understanding of the patriarchal household. I'm going to say that again. Skrodoff firmly rejects the typical allegorizing that identifies God as the father in the story, as this divinizes the patriarchal father and fosters a romantic understanding of the patriarchal household. That shakes some things up. Does it for you? Who grew up allegorizing the father with God? Tell us in the comments. I did. Even this week in retelling the story to my kids, that was the easy jump I made. So just like God always loves us, the father here always loves his children. See how powerful the patriarchy is? Okay, so if that's maybe not necessarily God in the story, where is God in the story? Let's keep digging. Moving to an anti-racist hermeneutic, we recall that whiteness is made up and at the same time, a very real functioning force in our society. White, due to new laws written by the ruling class in the 1600s, became a made up, privileged identity. And thus, Nicholas Powers makes the powerful case that the prodigal son is born. White and male, he got more rights, more land, more forgiveness, more chances, more parties, more compassion, more coddling, thereby leaving the human family. And why did that prodigal son, why did that white man ever return? Let's go back to the scripture. A severe famine took place throughout the country and he began to be in need. There was famine in the land. Huh. Something was missing for him. Something was lacking. He developed a hunger. Something, though white people masquerade as having everything figured out, is making us thirst. We are famished, aren't we? We're all experiencing, as Ruby Sales calls it, the death rattle of white supremacy, clinging to whatever she can to stay alive. But we're thirsty. White people know in our bones that the way this country is functioning isn't right, isn't holy, and isn't working. We know white people are soon to be the minority here, and that makes us scared. We know black people are excellent and overly qualified to do the work, whether it be parent, govern, teach, run, preach, heal, get elected to the Supreme Court of the United States or the Office of Vice President, but the tenacity of whiteness tells us we should be scared, that we should reject this because our false sense of power and control is better. But living in this false reality is famine. We're hungry for more because we've left the family. We left it 400 years ago and we leave it every damn day. Do we want to be found? Do we want to go home? Henry Nouwen says it well here. The further I run away from the place God dwells, the less I'm able to hear the voice that calls me beloved. And the less I hear that voice, the more entangled I become in the manipulations and power games of the world. In this story, moving with the allegory as the prodigal son, as the entitled white man or person, let's especially not leave white women out of this. Okay, Jane Campion, we see you in your racist remarks to the Williams sisters. The white child comes home. He gets hungry enough. He's drawn back to the promise of wholeness, healing, joy, life abundant, equality, peace, fairness, all things that make a home. And now he wants sympathy, though. He's, we're, 
I'm going to cry one tear and say one quick confession and that's it. We continue to understand why this story is unsettling. This country was built on the unpaid labor of black people and on stolen land from indigenous people. Not only was it built on that, we continue to exploit all people of color today while simultaneously pouring resources into white endeavors. Instead of paying reparations, in fleshed commentary says, parties are thrown every time a white person expresses the slightest bit of remorse over past or present engagement with white supremacy. How many times have we seen this when a white person comes home to an anti-racist ethic? End quote. How long, O oh Lord, will the younger son be favored? How long will we coddle and favor white mediocrity at the expense of neglecting the faithfulness of people of color. How long, oh Lord? Whose feelings are we protecting, centering, valuing? And whose are we neglecting? How might we rather be faithful to both relationships? Can we understand if we are the older brother that we are loved even when we are wronged? We are loved and we matter when our work is underpaid, invisible, constant, qualified, yet questioned. In an interview with Nikki Giovanni, James Baldwin said, for a long time, you think no one has ever suffered the way I suffered. Then you realize that your suffering does not isolate you. It's your bridge. So that you can bring a little light into their suffering so they can comprehend it and change it. Can we hold both the rightness that is the coming home and the faithfulness of the one who's never left? How might we translate these questions structurally as well? Who gets resources, protection, again from enfleshed? Those who are privileged in coming to recognize their complicity and showing up to a movement, or those who are the ones who have long been laboring and been present to the collective reality for some time? These are hard questions. Maybe it's why I don't love this parable. It's uncomfortable. It's not easy. It makes me wrestle with my whiteness, my privilege. It makes me ask questions about how we, how I can be better. It makes me come face to face in this season of Lent with my own whiteness and our entire human family and my role in it. The truth this parable is telling me today is this. This story is all of us because it's all about how we do life together. It's a snapshot of our shared reality. God's not the father, nor the younger or older son, but God is all in and around the story, the one who cares about how we figure it out. God's that entity, and no matter what character we resonate with, God is pushing us to grow and transform as we are human together. We're figuring out how to be kin together. God is loving us when we feel wronged and not seen. God is making a way out of no way when moving forward seems impossible. God is calling us to reconciliation, reparations, and God is calling us home when we fall prey to false idols of society, success, of justice, of family. God holds us in this work. Sometimes we get it right and sometimes we won't. We'll apologize and sometimes we'll get that wrong too. But it's all the work of reconciliation. Our faith calls us to live in shared resources, in forgiveness and equity and to examine the barriers to healing and restoration that are present, and to ask, why are they here? And how can we remove them? God asks questions about who's missing from the party and what the conditions are that led to famine and works with us as we strive to reconcile broken relationships and oppressive behaviors. And here's the other truth I think it's important to say that we know about God. We're never actually lost from God. God's always got us. We can run. We can squander. We can be jealous and mad. We can be overlooked, racially abused, patronized, oppressed. But we are never lost from God. Those things are not God. We've lost and forgotten our true worth as children of the divine, as God bearers, as people marked with the possibility, the call to reconcile all relationships and all things. But we are never lost from God. By ending the parable where it does, we gather that even if we don't know the outcome, even if we don't know how the two brothers will be, 
even if we don't know when the filibuster will be abolished and voting rights will be for all, or trans lives will really matter, or war will end and dictators will fall, when microaggressions will stop, when all have enough to eat, when the violence against Asian Americans will cease, even if we don't know, because we don't. We go have the meal when someone comes home and we invite others to join us too because we can rejoice at the possibility of forgiveness and restoration beginning while not forgetting the harm and transgressions that have occurred. We can be people brim brimming with audacious hope. Henry, now and again, I witness many signs of hope. I don't have to wait until all is well but I can celebrate every little hint of the kingdom that is at hand. And hope, abolitionist Miriam Kaba reminds us, isn't necessarily the same thing as optimism. Hope is a discipline that we have to practice every day. And what would it look like if we were always ready, always open to the possibility that transformation is possible? What would it look like if all white people came home, if white supremacy were finally abolished. God calls us to the work of collective reconciliation from where we are. The work doesn't look the same for everyone, but the call is. And in this work, we are not alone. We have each other and we have God. There's the grace in the story. There's the God in the story. The grace of God that binds us together again and again, again and again. The parable of the prodigal son is about the restoration of community, the urgent and long work of reconciliation, and the reminder that God's hand is always open and always at work among us, guiding, sustaining, loving us, no matter where we find ourselves in the long cast of characters. <laughs>